I grew up in Michigan and I went to a small Catholic high school and they had just a very, very small music program. But luckily, um, I had a great choir director and a great band director, even though the program was very small. Um, I got my first experience with jazz in high school. Um, I was, I think, the only person that knew how to play <laughs> piano. So my jazz band director said, hey, you're gonna play in the jazz band. So I uh, started there and he had gone to Berkeley School of Music. His name's Rod Schaub and just fabulous. And Cheryl, Gall Cheryl Gallus was my uh, choir teacher in high school. But that's kind of how I got started. And I was really into musical theater because we had set we just put on great musicals every year. So I thought actually in high school that I was gonna be a musical theater major when I went to college. Um, and then I decided to go to Western Michigan University and lo and behold, what is this thing called vocal jazz? I never experienced that in high school. Um, and one of my summer camp counselors recommended that I audition for for the gold company program and vocal jazz and i'm like what's vocal jazz so i auditioned and by some act of god made it into the program as a 18 year old freshman and i remember walking into the rehearsal room that first day and seeing all these microphones set up going what is this oh my gosh <laughs> um and duane davis was my very first vocal jazz director and Oh, I love that man so much. He's had such an incredible influence on my life. I still talk to him. In fact, I just called him last week and we spoke. And um, so Dwayne is, is um, a very, very important mentor figure in my life. And of course, Steve's agree. And I took private lessons with Sonny Wilkinson there at Western Michigan and just got a really great experience. And um, from there, there uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in music education and I was on classical vocal scholarship there. But I took all the jazz classes I could take because I loved it so much. So after I graduated from Western Michigan University, I was encouraged to apply for the Disney All-American College Jazz Band at Walt Disney World and I made it in. And I did that for two summers in, ooh, I don't want to say the years. <laughs> Let's just say. <laughs> In between my undergrad and my grad degrees, I did the All-American College Jazz Band in Walt Disney World, and that was a life-changing opportunity. Uh, we got to sing four shows a day, five days a week. Um, we s got to perform with Lionel Hampton and Mercer Ellington and Rosemary Clooney and Joe Williams and, uh, oh my gosh, the list goes on and on. Just so many amazing musicians. I got to meet Mel Torme and... So that changed the trajectory of my entire life and I decided I wanted to get a master's degree in jazz. So I went to the University of Miami where I studied with Larry Lappin and gosh, Whit Seidner and Vince Maggio and Rachel Laban and all of the, the great people that are there and were there. Gary Lindsay, mm, love, love, love them. And they were, it was a really, really wonderful program for me to be in and I'm very, very proud have, to have received my my degrees from both Western Michigan and University of Miami. Um, after that, I kind of, I, I was always singing. I had, I sang in rock bands when, when I was in college to, you know, pay the rent or over the summers or whatever. I was, I considered myself much more of a pop singer than a jazz singer when I was in undergrad. And that changed dramatically when I started um, my grad degree. And uh, I taught high school for a few years in Michigan and then in Northern California. Um, and then I, I uh, Phil, heard that Phil Matson was putting together a professional group that he wanted to start kind of the next PM Singers thing. And so Vocology was born under the direction of Phil Matson. And so I left the high school I was teaching at and moved to Iowa and worked with Phil for one year and then moved to Southern California 
um, which has been great, great for me here as well. Uh, I moved here, gosh, in 2001 and started teaching at Cal State Long Beach in January of 2002, so halfway through the school year. And I've been here ever since. Love Long Beach. When I was young and going through school, and even as, as far in as my graduate degree, I didn't know what I wanted to do or be. I didn't, you know, a lot of people have a dream. They're like, I'm going to be a studio singer. Or I'm going to be a recording artist on Blue Note record label or whatever. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, all I knew is that I wanted to pursue music and I just followed my bliss and I created opportunities for myself and I walked through doors that would open and I said yes to everything if I felt it was going to make me happy and and it led me to to this which is you know being a studio singer in LA and having a jazz community here that I am a part of and perform with and for and it led me to directing one of the top vocal jazz programs in the nation and now I feel like I'm living my dream but I didn't know it, what it was <laughs> until I got here. So I think that's okay for, for people to kind of figure things out as they go. Uh, yes, I am really fortunate to be a part of this amazing community of studio singers here in LA and I don't take it lightly. I'm so grateful. Uh, it really is not as much about how good you are. Yes, you have to be good and you have to be at the top of your game. But it's a lot about who you know, being in the right place at the right time, being somebody who's easy to work with, who gets along really well with others, um, who shows up, who's dependable. Those kinds of things really speak volumes. Um, it's been it's been a real joy to be able to be a part of, of that community and to get to walk on a sound stage. I'll never forget the first time I, I did a, a film session and I was walking onto the Warner Brothers lot and it was like I was going in slow motion. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe it was so and it's still every time I do it, I, I feel that way. It's just really a, a very, very cool experience to be part of. Um, and I'm surrounded by the best in the biz. I, I have so much respect for my friends and colleagues. Um, I was very lucky in that I met someone who was already in the studio scene. This is interesting. Okay, so Michelle Weir used to have a caroling company. And so when I first moved to LA, I wanted to do some gigs. And so she said, oh, come sing in my caroling company. And it was filled with amazing jazz singers and studio singers. And so um, a, a person that I met in that, Cindy Berkwin Dickin, uh, and I just hit it off because we had a very similar history and we knew a lot of the same people. Um, and so she introduced me to one of the top contractors in town. And so I had only been living here maybe two, three years before I started doing session work. I didn't even have a demo, which again is very rare to get hired to do work if you don't have a demo. Um, but it was word of mouth. It was uh, the contractor came to see me live and said, I like your stuff. And then when this contractor started using me, Bobby Page, love her so much, then other contractors started hiring me because they saw that she was. And, and then of course, a few years later, I did, I did my demo and um, so it was, for me, it was the networking, the professional networking and knowing people. Uh, the importance of sight singing, I can't emphasize enough. Uh, it's like we speak the English language and we have to learn how to read on the page, the music, it's, or the, the literature. <laughs> it's so important. The same applies to music. And um, if we're going to be musicians, I think it's important to be literate musicians and be able to have the musicianship skills to pick up a piece of paper and look at it and read it. Uh, the more you know, 
the more work you're going to get. The more prepared you are, the more marketable you, you can be. I think many singers can be intimidated by sight reading if they haven't grown up with that skill set or been taught that skill set, obviously. But it's never too late to learn, and there are so many teaching tools out there now. It's, it's only going to help you. It's, that's another important skill to have if you're getting your degree in jazz. It's crucial. It's tremendously important. Um, it's about learning vocabulary. And again, you know, we're, as we speak, we're putting together sent sentence structures and words and phrases, and it's the same as, as um, or very similar to learning how to improvise. It's learning the vocabulary. It's really hard to put together a musical sentence if you don't have any vocabulary. So how do you learn vocabulary? You learn it by listening, by transcribing, by learning patterns, by call and response. I mean, that's how little babies learn how to speak, is they imitate their mother and father and the sounds around them. So there, there are so many resources out there right now for singers to learn improvisation. Um, Darman Meter, I love his book. It's awesome. Um, and there's, you know, Bob Stoloff and Michelle Weir have books out that were specifically written for singers. There's just, and, and I think that's a good place to start for singers, but then go beyond that and look at some of the, the tools that are out there for instrumentalists as well because it's just going to help you build your vocabulary and your experience and your knowledge and um, sound authentic when you're improvising. I adore Gene Perling. Ugh, he's the best. Uh, just the genius behind his writing, uh, the phrasing, the harmony, J you know, the, the Singers Unlimited and the High Lows, oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> it's great. And, you know, he was commissioned to do works outside of those groups as well, and everything I've ever heard of his, he never misses. It's just always great and inspiring. Um, I love New York Voices, Darman Meter, such a brilliant musician and such a brilliant group of, of musicians. Uh, I mean, there's so many, it's really hard. Um, I love Take Six. I, oh man, one of the most moving experiences I had as an audience member was when Take Six sang at the Hollywood Bowl in here in Southern California. And I was way, way up, <laughs> so far away from the stage, but they made me feel like they were wrapping me in a warm blanket. And I just remember being so moved by their, their music and their delivery and their connection with the audience, even in such a, a tremendously big hall. So I would say, I mean, like I said, it's hard to choose, but those are definitely at the very top. I'm, I, a lot of people don't necessarily think of Bobby McFerrin as a vocal jazz ensemble, but his stuff is all harmony, so I kind of put him in that category, and he was just, when he came out, such an innovator with, with what he did, um, so I'm a big fan of his as well. Uh, I think this pandemic has been a tragedy in so many ways. But one benefit coming out of this, one I think something that's really going to change in education, music education, is what we're speaking about is the audio video production because so many people last minute had to convert and do things uh, through distance learning and online and re recording remotely. And so, and there have been some great projects that have come out of that that were done very professionally. I think one of the reasons that it's taken so long and is taking so long is budget constraints, um, but it's getting easier and easier because software is coming down in price and even hardware is coming down in price and you can do something that looks professional for not a lot of money, but I think it's going to get a lot better and we've, we've already seen that in the last couple months.
So that's really encouraging. There are a lot of things on YouTube, my own program included, where somebody's got a camera, a phone in the audience, and then that ends up on YouTube, and that's representing the program, which isn't always the best. And it never sounds as good as it would live <laughs> when somebody's recording from their phone. So, you know, we've got, we've got a ways to go, but I think we're, we're slowly starting to get there. In the past, we've been lucky in that the film department will call us up and say, hey, we want to give our students experience filming a live musical event. Can we come view, film, film your concert? And it's great, but at the same time, they've got students. On, it it kind of takes away from the, the audience's experience because the stage is small and they've got all this big equipment zooming in and out and they're, they're riding <laughs> It was a little bit, it was a little bit nuts. They've done it, the second time was much better. We said, you know, we got to tone that down a little bit. But, but I think getting in touch with your, if, if you have a film or drama or a student club, even at the high school level, that is interested in doing that kind of thing, it's, it would be great to collaborate because that takes a little bit of the pressure off of the music instructor who's playing, so, just wearing so many different hats. I'm incredibly grateful for Dwayne Davis and Steve Zagree and Larry Lappin and Sonny Wilkinson who played such major roles in my musical development and my development as a human being and as an artist. I'm so grateful to people who have lifted, lifted me up and encouraged me along the way. Michelle Weir, Roger Treese. Uh, my friends, Kate Reed and Greg Jaspers and Jennifer Barnes, <laughs> we were all in school together. We all went to Western Michigan and Miami and, the, uh, and to Matt Falker and my friends who write, oh my gosh, so grateful to so many people. I, I would love to list every single one. Um, it's important to remember and, and thank those people in your daily life. I, I have a spiritual practice and, and I thank the people who have lifted me up and supported me throughout my entire career, including my students. Oh, my students are amazing and I've learned so much from them. I'm eternally grateful.